Father God, thank you for this morning so far. Thank you for your presence with us as we have worshipped and celebrated, as we've thought back, as we've thought about the Nicene Creed, thought about our faith, as we've thought in the present, as we've shared communion, as we've celebrated the uh, new shape of our building, and as we've thought into the future too, the fact that we are a new creation, no more in condemnation, standing in your grace, and looked ahead with that. Father God, thank you. And now as we come to look at your word, we thank you for your word. Father, as we continue to explore this strange book, I ask that you will continue to speak to us, challenge us, help us in our understanding. In Jesus' name, amen. Now in some films you have sort of, you know, good cop, bad cop. I feel a bit like that with Pastor Warren and me at the moment with, with the Bible teaching, because we're both doing series, and he's looking at the delightful and encouraging and uh, easy to understand book of James, and here am I wrestling with the uh, rather strange, very uncomfortable, but equally relevant book of Ecclesiastes. So uh, you've had him for the last two weeks. So you've got me today, so it's bad pastor day today. So, uh. so we're looking at Ecclesiastes, so you might want to, uh, to turn to that. We're looking from chapter 8, verse 10, to 9, verse 12. And the warm and welcoming title for today is Death's Shadow. As I say often, I I really enjoy reading the book of Ecclesiastes, which might just say something about my strangeness. It it relentlessly asks tough questions about life. And we live in a culture that doesn't like looking at the tough questions, that just pretends that those tough questions aren't actually there. And these tough questions... Uh, They undermine confidence in human wisdom. They undermine confidence and trust in human institutions, in human pleasure and human justice. And its themes include, and we're going to look at this again today because it's a major theme of this book, how frail and fragile human life is. I was talking to one of my friends this week. Uh, not someone who, who you know. Uh, he's younger than me. Um, his wife has just been diagnosed with a very aggressive uh, cancer, which seems to have spread to uh, a number of parts of her body. The only qu- the question is whether it is worth them actually having any treatment or whether just to accept life as it is. His sister... This week had major surgery because of cancer and his niece has just been diagnosed with cancer this week. Uh, And we were just talking, you know, just chatting together, say he's he's a few years younger than me. And uh, just away, all of this hit him in just a matter of a couple of weeks It went from nothing to all of this. And it brings home how fragile life is. He's in the process of thinking through now his own life and work and ministry and uh, what changes might be appropriate in the light of his circumstances. And it underlines to us this book how important it is for us to seize the day to seize the moment, to grab what we have in God and to seize that. If you want to know more about the background to this book, it's uh, on the internet, it's in section one of this series. Uh, I unpack some of the background and history, not going to talk about that today. Well, we're well into this book, we're into, uh, towards the end of chapter eight, going into chapter nine, it's been 
a month since I have spoken because I've been uh, quite busy with the, uh, the college where I'm a tutor. This is a busy term for me. I'm responsible for um, the, uh, all the material this term. So uh, I'm actually in the process of delivering that in various contexts around the UK. Um, so hence I've not been, uh, had time to do preparation, uh, which is why you've had the pleasure of uh, Pastor Warren speaking these last couple of weeks. So we're somewhere into the book. So here's the revision question for today. Uh, someone asked me um, during the week, are you preaching this Sunday, Pastor? And I said, yes. They said, I need to look back at my notes then. <laughs> so we're not gonna, I'm not going to ask you what did we learn last time because you may not be able to remember specifically what we looked at four weeks ago. But what, in addition to what I've said so far, have been some of the key themes, some of the key things that have challenged you, have challenged us as we've begun to work through this book of Ecclesiastes. What have been some of the key things? I thought you had your hand up then, Timmy. I, I just, um, just scratching, yeah. <laughs> Can you just make it more obvious when you're actually scratching rather than when you put your hand up? Just to... No, without God, life is meaningless. Mm -hmm. Meaningless is one of the most common words in this book. Everything we have on this earth is from God. Yeah. Amen. What else? Life is fragile, seize the day. Mm -hmm. Life's fragile, seize the day. Anything else? Okay, that's a pretty good summary so far. That's one of the key things that I keep coming back to when I'm talking to people at the moment, and that is about the fact that, that life's path is not straightforward. Life is... All full of all sorts of twists and turns. And uh, you remember I've talked about the fact that I do a lot, of, uh, a lot of walking, a lot of mountain walking. It's one of my favourite recreations. And uh, I just in my mind at the moment is a walk that I, I did a couple of years ago. And I could see the destination, a particular hut that uh, we were walking towards where there were going to be some refreshments. So, um, and it only looked just over there. So, you know, get quite excited. We've been walking for quite a long time. This was early afternoon. And uh, so we see the hut and we're thinking, oh, that's not very far. So we walk towards it. And then we discover there is this big ravine and we've got this detour all the way along here and all the way back up there. And when we get to the other side, it's, I exaggerate slightly, but it's like walking up like this. And it took us, you know, you looked at it and thought, oh, we'll be there in an hour. Well, I think it was nearer three and a half the time we got there, we were exhausted. And life's a bit like that. And that's one of the themes of this book as well, that there are these twists and turns in life. So let's go in to look at the material today. So we're starting at chapter 8 and verse 10. And uh, as always, I've got a number of questions to ask you as we go through. Um, uh, some are you know, looking at the text and asking questions about that. Mostly they're about asking about our context uh, today and how this works for us. Chapter 8 and verse 10. Then I too saw the wicked buried. Those who used to come and go from the holy places. This is the wicked. Used to come and go from the holy place and receive praise in the city where they did this. This too is meaningless. When the sentence for a crime is not quickly carried out, the hearts of the people are filled with schemes to do wrong. So for this writer, um, receiving a proper burial was a mark of being honoured. So he looks at this context and sees these people, wicked people, being praised, even in the context of the temple, the holy place. But they are wicked people, and they're being honoured in their burial, but they are wicked people. And he looks at that and says, oh, this is meaningless. And then he looks at the fact that guilty people sometimes don't seem to be punished quickly. And he observes that encourages just more wrongdoing. We're going to come back to that. He picks it up again in a few minutes. 
Although a wicked man commits a hundred crimes and still lives a long time, I know that it will go better with God-fearing men who are reverent before God. Yet because the wicked do not fear God, it will not go well with them, and their days will not lengthen like a shadow. Notice the change here. It's a really important change from I see to I know. It's a really important change. and We're going to work with that as we go through this morning. These verses are a statement of faith, which go beyond what the human eye can see to what the heart knows and understands. There's a big difference between what we can see under the sun. This phrase, under the sun, we, it comes up again later on. Uh, under the sun here is um, a phrase that means we're looking at life, ignoring God. Looking at it just from a human perspective. Just looking at it just under the sun, not, not under God. And one of the things that the book of Ecclesiastes is doing is pushing this perspective of human life with God ignored, with God bracketed out. What, what, what's life like if we take God out of the picture? And he keeps coming up with the word meaningless. And there's a big difference between what you can see with your eye in human terms and what you can know with the eye of faith. Huge difference between those things. We all can see wicked people who prosper, apparently. I, I don't just mean people that you might know who live down the street from you. But you look on the world stage and you see some rulers of countries And they're clearly wicked people. And yet some of them seem to prosper. But the eye of faith knows that sin will be punished. That there will be judgment. Let's just push this a bit more, verse 14. There is something else meaningless that occurs on earth. Righteous men who get what the wicked deserve and wicked men who get what the righteous deserve. This too, I say, is meaningless. So, I commend the enjoyment of life because nothing is better for a man under the sun than to eat and drink and be glad. Then joy will accompany him in his work all the days of the life God has given him under the sun. When I applied my mind to know wisdom and to observe man's labor on earth, his eyes not seeing sleep day or night, that I saw all that God had done. No one can comprehend what goes on under the sun. Despite all his efforts to search it out, man cannot discover its meaning. Even if a wise man claims he knows, he cannot really comprehend it. Now, the under-the-sun logic here is life's meaningless. There is no God. We might as well just eat, drink, and be merry. For, as the saying goes, tomorrow we die. Which is optimistic, because it might be today. Life under the sun cannot be figured out. It's an enigma. It's a puzzle. It's a mystery. It is meaningless. Life bracketing out God is a puzzle without a solution. 
Not one that seems like, you know, some of these puzzles you find in puzzle books, it seems like there's no solution, but you know that there is a solution somewhere. Life, if you bracket God out, is a puzzle without any solution. And as one of the writers I read this week, Brown says, all claims to full and certain knowledge are rendered false. Now, here's my question. I want you to think about, not then, this, as you know, was written thousands of years ago. I want you to think about our context today. Your context, my context, the society in which we live and work today. And I want you to ask this question. These stack here of observations about life, looking at life under the sun, and then again looking at life in the context of God, that he weaves together in these observations. How do they apply in our context, our situations? What are the things that this touches for us? So I'll give you a moment to think about that, and then... Uh, If you scratch your head, I'll come and bring the microphone. Because as I often say, it's not enough to read the scripture in the past. It's not even enough to understand it in the past. It actually, we have to work at it and think, well, what does it mean today in our context, our situation? Otherwise, it's just a history lesson. Well, we have a lot of new philosophy, new morals that are really just foolishness and that are, that are completely ungodly, that um, are just based upon the way a person thinks. And, uh, you know, the, the, the people who are propounding these things do very well and uh, get a, draw a crowd and get a lot of praise. But what they're saying is still nonsense. Do you want to nail some colors to the mask and, and name some of these new sorts of... Uh philosophies, this stuff that is around, that seems to, or what you're saying, these actually, they claim to explain everything, but they're just meaningless human wisdom. Well, there's the, the whole thing of monosex, you know. <clears throat> We're all the same, just after all. There's, um, you know, um, that, uh, you know, that whatever relationship a person, person wants, then that, that's just fine. Um, there's also the idea that, you know, that, um, well, I don't know how to express this very well. Um, what are you thinking about that? Just explain that uh, part of what Doug does is researches some of this stuff. So uh, that's why I'm pushing him on this question. So, uh. <laughs> Okay. Um, s some of the other issues that we, we, we run into... Or, or that you know, trying, trying to, um, trying to exceed, succeed, do well, is is just really it's it's a bunch of foolishness. Um, we have the idea that government should be responsible for all of us, should take care of us, and uh, you know, and 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 just pr provide a way. Uh, we have we build up huge debts for society. Somebody is going to have to pay that debt someday, but uh, it's probably going to be our children and grandchildren, and, and we're just leaving it there for them. Okay, and your, and your accent tells me that that's not just talking about the UK government, but some uh, government from the country that you come from. Okay. Other comments? Thank you, Doug. Um, we can't judge what happens like um, natural disasters, illness, death, 
we can't base God's non-existence, his lack of love, as people will say, or his lack of grace, because it's quite the opposite, based on those things that happen on earth. Because as it says, evil things will happen unexpectedly. It doesn't um, defy God's love, existence, or grace for humankind. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? Okay, let's move into this next uh, section. This section, being of chapter nine, is uh, a key section in this, this book. It, it, it reaches some of the things that you're going to hear. You think, oh, I'm sure he said that earlier on, and you're right, he did. It draws together a number, of, brings a, to a climax some of the writer's observations about life and death, and it begins to work towards the understanding of what life really means, which becomes clearer later in the, uh, the book. Uh, so, uh, here we go. So I reflected on all of this and concluded that the righteous and the wise and what they do are in God's hands. But no man knows whether love or hate awaits him. All share a common destiny, the righteous and the wicked, the good and the bad, the clean and the unclean, those who offer sacrifices and those who do not. As it is with the good man, so with the sinner. As it is with those who take oaths, so it is with those who are afraid to take them. This is the evil in everything that happens under the sun. The same destiny overtakes all. The hearts of men, moreover, are full of evil. And there is madness in their hearts while they live. And afterwards, they join the dead. Now, traditional Jewish wisdom, which was the context that the writer was writing in, believed that there was a direct connection between how you lived your life and how long you lived for. And that sort of connection is still around to some extent today. You know, the question you can almost guarantee is going to be asked when they're interviewing the oldest person in the world, whoever it happens to be at that point in time, or someone's getting on towards there, is, you know, how have you lived your life so that you have um, lived to this age? And they might say, well, you know, I just smoked 10 cigarettes today and drank a half a bottle of whiskey every day and that's why I've lived to 110 and the, and the reviewer, interviewer nods and you know, thinks, well, this is obviously great wisdom. I, I exaggerate slightly, but it's often not much better than that, frankly. But there is that sort of assumption that's, that's around. But the wisdom also at that time, Jewish traditional wisdom, was that good people who honoured God with sacrifices and made good oaths and promises to God would live long. And bad people, and in their eye they were the people who did not honour God, who did not make those sacrifices, who did not make those commitments, they would not live long. But as the writer looked around and observed, he observed that actually no such connection was visible. Some good people died young in tragic circumstances. And I'm sure you can all think of people that you maybe personally have known. 
Good people, however you define that. God-honoring people who in tragic circumstances died young. The last time I spoke about this passage, I was looking back at my notes. It was a long time ago. But the brother of someone in the congregation who was a missionary working overseas had been killed. Um, they were in a car and they were hit. The car was hit by a lorry and they died. We'd prayed about that earlier in the meeting that morning. So here, you know, you've got a good person who's, who's looking to serve God in a particular context. They're a Christian. And here they were, killed in tragic and, in human terms, pointless circumstances. And I'm sure you can also think of people who perhaps you consider to be evil, who live long lives with wealth and prosperity. And as he looked around, he could see that and says, this traditional wisdom, it doesn't seem to be true. And in the end, all of them, good, evil, and everything in between, die. They're swept away by death. As again, Brown, one of the writers I was reading this week, he sums it up really sharply. He says, moral distinctions count for nothing before indiscriminate death. There is this odd phrase that's in here. It's a word that doesn't translate terribly well into English. In, in verse 3, the hearts of men, moreover, are full of evil and there is madness in their hearts while they live. And uh, the, the essence behind that uh, word, I'm not a Hebrew scholar, I'm drawing from other people, the, the essence behind that word is, is this that in someone's heart... Now, the heart in this context is, is standing for the, um, for the will. It's the, it's the seat of, in the Old Testament, the heart is not the seat of emotion. It's the seat of will and decision-making. In the New Testament, the heart is the seat like for us. You know, we talk about people uh, in, in love, you know, or, or when they, you know, and, and their love doesn't work. We have a broken heart. The heart is the seat of emotion. But in Old Testament times, that wasn't where emotion was seated. If you're interested, emotion was seated in the bowels. <laughs> which you find reflected in the Psalms. It's why you talk about people having things, you know, they, they talk about stuff in their bowels. Well, that's equivalent to heart. And um, heart is equivalent to head. All right, you're with me. So... It's all moved down one in the Old Testament from where it is in, in the New. I, you know, I'm not saying one's better than the other. I'm just observing that is, that is how it is. So, so in, in their heart, so in their brains, if we're going to put it in, in our language for today, in their heads is madness. Which makes a lot more sense than having madness in the heart in the way we think about you know, the use of the heart. So let's think about heads because that's a much better... So there's madness... In their heads. And, and, and that madness, one of the other people I read this week, he, he talks about it as being a moral wilderness that's irrational and impetuous. That's a guy called Eton. And what the writer, what, what the writer of Ecclesiastes is saying is he's making a really important observation. That when life is seen to be meaningless, evil predominates. When life is seen to be meaningless, evil predominates. Because there is no reason for it not to. And that produces what he calls a madness 
in people's thinking. And I'm sure, you know, you can, you can look back through the news in the last week. You haven't got to look very far back in the news in the last week. And you can see things and you look at it and you think, that action is just madness. And it's coming out of a meaningless context. One other person I read this week, Derek Kidner, he, he wrote this. To live in an apparently meaningless world is deeply disillusioning. And disillusion breeds destruction or despair, which leads to the madness of the violent or of the hopelessly withdrawn. We're going to pick those things up again in a moment. So I'm just going to. Are you glad you came this morning? I'd yes. be pleased when James is back in a couple of weeks' time. So. Because it's going to get a bit worse yet. So um, stay, stay with me. Anyone, verse 4, who is among the living has hope. Even a live dog is better off than a dead lion. I'll explain that proverb in a moment. For the living, notice just the irony here, for the living know that they will die. But the dead know nothing. They have no further reward. Even the memory of them is forgotten. Their love, their hate, their jealousy have long since vanished. Never again will they have a part in anything that happens under the sun. <laughs> now, I need to explain some of this. In, in the ancient Near East, you see, you, you English people who are here in the congregation, those of you from other um, uh, countries, you wouldn't quite understand the same way. But, you know, English people, you have the word dog and you go, ah, and you see this nice animal with big wet eyes and nice tail and big ears and you just imagine yourself some, I can see some of you overseas thinking these English people are balmy well that is true um, you know just you know you just this imagine you know just stroking this yeah I can see it that you're sitting in the congregation doing it some of you you're there just imagining stroking this uh, this dog well you know, ancient Near East forget all of that the dog was considered to be an absolutely despised animal yeah oh, what do you mean ah oh. Dear, oh dear. It was a despised animal. It was seen as a filthy scavenger. Don't you sit there and say no. It's true. It was a filthy scavenger. <laughs> oh. They weren't kept as pets. Just accept it, all right? The lion, the lion was considered to be the king of all animals. The greatest, the best, the most fantastic of all animals. Now you see the force of the proverb here. Do you get it now? Even a live dog is better off than a dead lion. Do you get how the force of that works? <laughs> and then you've got, for the living know that they will die. Verse 4 and 5 is, is actually uh, irony. If you do irony, you'll recognize it. it, it the point being that the, he's making here that under the sun, the only advantage of being alive is that you know you're going to die. Isn't that good news? But there is something actually here much, much deeper. I make a lot of humour and fun at this because I want you to get hold of the point. But there is something actually much, much deeper here. The fact is, the fact is, 
and we've looked at this once before, the fact is that all of us, all of us live in the shadow of death. Do you remember I got you some months ago now to turn to another and say, I'm going to die. And turn to the person next to you and say, and so are you. And there was like then lots of nervous laughter around. Because that is the reality. And one of the things about Ecclesiastes, it faces us up to reality. You know, you, 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 you could go living in our society here in West London. And, uh, you know, you would think that, you'd almost think that people don't die. That it's not going to happen. And when it does happen, people think that that is somehow unexpected. It's an intrusion into life. A lot of English people avoid the whole thing. I think I've told you before about the, the fact, I know some of you from overseas will find this really strange, but uh, when, I, when I take funerals for English people, there's often hardly anybody there. I've done funerals with two people present. Two people present. I've talked to relatives prior to funerals. They say, well, I'm not going to the funeral. I want to remember them alive. Uh, but you know, they're dead. But they don't want to accept it. You see, if we recognize the reality of the shadow, we can live our lives in an appropriate way. We can grab the moment. We can seize the day. We can make a difference. And the more you recognize that actually the time we have on earth is really short. And we don't know how short it's going to be. No idea. But we know it's going to be short. Even if you manage to make it to 80 or 90, it's still a short period of time. It goes so quick. This morning, you know, we've talked about the fact I've been here as pastor for 27 years. Only seems like the day before yesterday I started here. It might seem a lot longer to some of you. Think, oh, no. <laughs> but you, know, you look back in your life and time, where's it gone? How often do you hear people say that? You know, where's the last week, month, year gone? Decade. Lifetime. But if we recognize the reality of the shadow, we can choose to grab those moments and make them count. Now, when you're looking at life under the sun, part of the point he's making here, there can't be anything beyond the grave. Because if you take out God and anything of that sort, then what there is is what you see. And there isn't anything else. And remember also that in the Old Testament times, at this time in their history, even the godly had not a lot to look forward to after death. Let me just read a description to you of, um, this, is, this is a godly person picturing what life after death might look like. Okay, it's Job chapter 10. You don't need to turn to it. It's just a few verses. If you want to turn to it, it's verse um, 18 down to 22. So this is their picture, a godly person's picture of, of life beyond the grave. He's obviously having a bad day because he begins, Why then did you bring me out of the womb? I wish I died before any eyes saw me. If only I'd never come into being or have been carried straight from the womb to the grave. Are not my few days almost over? Turn away from me so that I can have a moment's joy. And here's the description of 
the life after death, before I go to the place of no return, to the land of gloom and deep shadow, to the land of deepest night, of deep shadow and disorder, where even the light is like darkness. The destination for people after they died was called Shale, and it was the place of shadows. There wasn't really life there, there wasn't light there, which just stepping out of Ecclesiastes for a moment and into the New Testament, in, in the book of Revelation, when heaven is pictured, what's one of the key things about it? Light. It's full of light. There's no sun there because God's light fills the place. Light and life. In the Old Testament, what they pictured was darkness and gloom. And as Job, in the book of Job, it's pictured, it's the end of everything that, that gives life any meaning or, or substance. Aren't you glad you came this morning? So, these uh, verses in chapter 9 that we've, we've looked at, this shadow of death, this common destiny for all as the NIV heads it. What, what do you make of this under the sun view of life I'm going to ask you the other question in a few minutes time about the contrast between that and living in the relationship with God but this view of life under the sun bracketing God out what do you what do you make of that when you look at our own context our own culture today you get the question hmm Difficult questions today. Sometimes I ask you easy questions, but um, I haven't been here for a, you know teaching for a month, so I thought I'd get some really good questions for you today. Difficult questions, Hannah. Um, in our context today, um, under the sun, you can take an example of um, the IS people. Uh, in the I won't call it their hearts. In the head of it is probably thinking, we can do what we want. We can make a statement, we can kill and we can take people. At the end of the day, we're all going to die. We just want to make a statement and it doesn't matter because if they have a heart, they won't do that. And under the sun, the scene is it's good. We're, gonna, we're only going to live once and die and that's it. We can do what we can. We can do what we want. Okay, thank you. What other reflections do you have? If people are living under the sun, they better enjoy it because that's all they've got to look forward to. Yeah. Anything else? It, it disturbingly makes sense. That, that, that's the problem because if that's all there is, then... Why shouldn't you do whatever you want? And it, and it also reduces it to the microcosm, which is just you. That, that's the point. It becomes a completely individualistic society, which is probably what we've got outside these four walls anyway, where you're not answerable to anybody, and it's basically about me. It's, it's, basically, it's basically what we used to call the Witham Society, what's in it for me. Because nobody else really counts. Because why should they? Because this is all there is, so who am I most interested in? Well, me. <laughs> Instead of a corporate sense of responsibility, am I my brother's keeper? Yes, I am. But I don't have to answer for any of that if it's just me. The philosophy that people have used to describe it is the word hedonism. Yeah. It's about putting me at the centre and my pleasure at the centre and nothing else actually matters 
whatsoever because there isn't anything else of any significance. It's just about me and my pleasure. Utterly individualistic, utterly selfish. And that's life under the sun. Because there's no reason for anything different. I don't know if this is right, but it says God is proper in his dealings with men. He's proper in his relationship. And everything he does is right. But man does the opposite. He just wants to do what he wants and enjoy whatever is under the sun without God. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Let's move on. Still got another five or six verses I want to look at today. So... Um, verses 7 to, to 10. Go eat your food with gladness. Drink your wine with a joyful heart. For it is now that God favours what you do. Always be clothed in white. We'll explain that in a moment. Always anoint your head with oil. Enjoy life with your wife whom you love. All the days of this meaningless life that God has given you under the sun. All your meaningless days. For this is your lot in life and in your toilsome labor under the sun. Whatever your hands find to do, do it with all your might. For in the grave, now remember that in his mind is that image that we read earlier on. In the grave where you are going. And the word there actually is the word sheol in the Hebrew. So it's that that shades we read about just now for in the grave in shale where you are going there is neither working nor planning nor knowledge nor wisdom so it's what john was saying is if what's been said so far under the sun is true then we might as well make the most of this meaningless existence clothed in white anointed with oil Again, other cultures, you'd recognize those things as both being joyful activities, very pleasant in hot places. Probably not so pleasant this morning in North Holt, where at 8 o'clock it was only 2 degrees. Note the reference also to the companionship here of married life. Notice the commendation of enjoying work, putting, all, putting your all into it. For working is, in fact, the celebration of life. And that's a big shift from earlier in the book. Do you remember when he was looking at work and was saying, this is meaningless, what you get for the toil? Now, as he's working through, he's beginning to make the statement that work is something which is life-affirming. It's a life-affirming vocation, as one person put it. And, and notice the switch backwards and forwards. He's looking at life under the sun, but he's commenting on God. As he moves backwards and forwards between these things, because the writer doesn't believe that life under the sun is really all there is. Because if it is, it's merely a few moments of sensual pleasure while we wait to die. Let me read these last couple of verses, then I'm going to ask you a question that goes back over uh, these things. So verse 11 and 12. I've seen something else under the sun. The race is not to the swift or the battle to the strong. Nor does food come to the wise or wealth to the brilliant or favor to the learned. But time and chance happen to them all. Moreover, no man knows when his hour will come, as fish are caught in a cruel net, or birds are taken in a snare. So men are trapped by evil times that fall unexpectedly upon them. Life seems unpredictable. No matter how carefully you plan things out, the unexpected happens. Sometimes apparently random calamities occur. The only predictable things that in the end death always comes and it's nearly always unexpected. Just like for fish swimming happily in the sea. 
really came, this verse just hit me. I was on Friday evening. We had some guests staying. I'd gone and bought some fresh fish and uh, whole fish. I was just cleaning up in one of the jobs I used to do many years ago. I used to be a fishmonger. So I actually quite enjoy the whole thing of getting whole fish and cleaning them and all of that. And Anyway, I was just thinking about these four uh, fish that had been happily swimming in the sea only a couple of days before. And here am I just taking their insides out, removing their gills, getting ready to go in the oven. And, and uh, sorry, Pastor Warren's face, he hates fish. He really doesn't like fish. When we go and eat out together, what he likes, I don't like, and what I like, he doesn't like. So that, that just makes uh, finding places to eat really quite amusing. But there we go. Um, I was thinking about these fish. You know, they were swimming happily in the sea. I mean, these four fish might have all been friends for all I know. I've got absolutely no idea. <laughs> and here they are now on my chopping board. And he uses that as an image about the way that death comes. Just so suddenly and unexpectedly. So my final question in the last few minutes that we've got this morning. You know, we've talked about the fact that life has twists and turns. We've talked about unpredictable calamity. Christians often say to me when we're talking about some unexpected difficulty or disaster that's happened, there has to be a reason. Here's my question for you this morning. Is that, in the light of what we've been reading here, is that the best response that we as Christians should have when those things happen? Or is there something better? Think about that for a moment. That's a hard question. The subtext is I don't think it's the best answer. So you can get that by the fact I'm answering the question. So, uh, I could see the cogs turning away there, John. Well, I think, I think whether it's the best answer or not depends on why you're asking the question. Um, because sometimes when we say there must be a reason, what, what we're actually saying is I need to know the answer because I need to be in control. I, I need to determine my destiny. So, so therefore, I'm owed an answer, which therefore means it, it's, it's not the best resolution because that basically just brings it back to me being individualistic about, about me. Um, because sometimes it's about accepting that you don't see everything visually um, because that's what walking in the unseen is about that sometimes you can't square everything off and you can't you can't say my world is alright because I can square everything off you have, you have to be able to say, my world is all right because even though it looks awful, this is what I understand. And then that's unseen. So it kind of depends why you're asking the question. Okay. Thank you, John. Anybody else? Um, we're sharing the same world as the people living under the sun. So the same things happen to us that happen to them. But God can use it and give it purpose and meaning if we let him. Thank you. 
Any other comments? Oh, I've got a queue in the front row. You see, you should sit in the front. Obviously, it's more inspired in the front row. The Bible says all things work together for those who love the Lord. And in my life, sometimes I have seen, I ask question, why did this happen? I was so cautious. I tried my best. Why did it happen, Lord? And then, not immediately, maybe after a month, even years, after years, you see why it happened, what was God's purpose. Okay, thank you. And finally? Yeah. Um, it comes back to, in the NLT version, it talks, that verse earlier on talks about them choosing their mad course because they have no hope. And when you have no hope, you cling to circumstances. And when circumstances go wrong, you want to know the answer why. You can't know the answer why all the time. But God brings that hope. So our hope is in God and not in circumstances. And so when the answers don't come through circumstances, we have God. And so yes, it doesn't matter. Thank you. The reason I don't think it's often the best response is it doesn't actually matter whether or not there is a reason. What matters is our response to what happens. I believe Joan is absolutely right. We, we live in a world that's broken. And uh, bad things happen. Some of those bad things happen because some people choose to do something selfish that has repercussions for other people. And we happen to be around. We happen to get in the way. We happen to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. We've seen examples of that just down the canal from here. And our response has to be one of trust in God. And as we trust in God, we find meaning, not in what has happened, but in what God does in us and through us in that difficult circumstance as we put our trust and faith in him. There's a huge difference to living under the sun in a life of meaningless meaninglessness and hopelessness and living in relationship with God because of what we see with our eye of faith what we know in our hearts and in those situations whatever comes our way as we live in the shadow of death we do so in relationship with God we can make our lives count and make a difference because of our relationship with God Let's, uh, our time is gone this morning, let's stand together if you're able to and just give you a moment of silence to make a, your own response to God and then I'm going to lead us in prayer. Father God, thank you that we don't have to live life under the sun. That we live our life in relationship with you. And though we live in a broken world and we recognize that death itself was not something which you had as your original intention for us as human beings, but came about because of human beings' decision to live their lives separate from you. But Father, thank you that we live in this broken world with its twists and turns in relationship with you. Father, help us this week, every one of us who is here in the room now, those who are watching this subsequently, help us this week for every one of us to seize the moments that we have, to make a difference for you in our context, in our situation, whatever comes our way, welcome or unwelcome, difficult or straightforward, tragic or or really happy. Help us to make a difference 
by living that moment in relationship with you and allowing you to give it meaning and significance as you work in us and through us in our broken and hurting world. In Jesus' name. Amen. We do hope you've enjoyed and benefited from this presentation. To learn more about what the Bible teaches us and how to apply this to our everyday lives, check out our biblical teaching videos at gbcweb.tv.